Welcome to a live edition of the Deep Look podcast as we get set for the Under-24 World Championships in Nottingham, UK. I'm Charlie Eisenhood, joined by Keith Rayner. Keith, we haven't had a U-24 tournament since 2019. We basically missed a whole generation, but we're back. And this was maybe my favorite tournament in 2019, uh, going over to Heidelberg, Germany, for U24's uh, awesome tournament. USA ended up sweeping gold for the second straight time. Uh, They won them all in 2017 as well. And they will certainly be the favorites yet again here this year. Keith, are you excited for a little international college-aged action? I'm thrilled. Uh, Like you, I thought the 2019 U24 championships were uh, really exciting. There was a lot of great ultimate play. And honestly, while I do think the U.S. is going to be pretty heavy favorites in every division, I think that the past few international competitions has shown a higher quality of play for the general global ultimate community. And so there's a lot of players that we're not going to know because we didn't get, we missed out on on basically a U20 cycle and a U23 cycle. So there's these players who kind of been in obscurity from the major like American North American audience and probably are mostly known within their own uh, larger regional communities, the European community or the AO community. And now we're going to get to see those players break out in a big way uh, on the big stage. So, uh, you know, challenging the U S is going to be hard, but I do expect to see some players we've never heard of come out and, and look like superstars. I don't think the question is whether we're going to see star level top tier players on other teams besides the US. That is not in question for me. We've seen that every year. The problem that teams face against the US is that their sixth and seventh players on the line typically do not match up well with the the next, you know, the bottom two players on the US line. And that gets even more pronounced as you move down the roster. So those teams are going to have to rely on you know, really good chemistry with one another uh, and taking advantage of potential offensive miscues from U.S., which we've seen. You know, we, you go back to World Games last year, the U.S. did not look right for most of that tournament. And they basically kind of barely got it together to win the whole thing. Um, but it, they, they look susceptible. Now, that format is not at this format where, you know, you have bigger rosters more depth comes into play here than it does at World Games, um, particularly when you look across all three divisions. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get right into stuff. I, I, I was just looking, Keith, at the USA rosters again as we're getting ready for the uh, tournament. And, uh, you know, having having gone through college nationals where, you know, the large majority of players were competing that are going to be on these teams. I mean, the they are... <laughs> They are so stacked. I, th- there are very few players that when I scroll these lists where I say to myself, I'm not sure that player should have made it. That did not happen to me. And, and, and less so than in other years for you know, any of the USA rosters. Uh, just so strong, uh, top to bottom. And I, I do have to say, you know, heading into the tournament, it's hard for me to see these teams losing. It is, although I, I feel like that pretty much every year but but to your point you know i I do think there's an interesting competition i I haven't quite done the like deep dive to figure out like okay how do these teams stack up to the last two or three iterations like do they seem like if we if we put them all you know in a tournament like who's going to come out on top uh that part i i I don't know but obviously these teams are just absolutely loaded with with stars uh from all all around the college division players who already had a, a bunch of club success players who were used to seeing deal with each other. You know, we, we spend the whole year talking about, okay, how does Abby Hecko match up with Don Colton? Well, now they're running down to the pool together and it's somebody else's problem to figure out. Uh, and then in particular, I find this men's roster intriguing because basically almost everyone on the team is playing with at least one. And in some cases, four teammates, uh, that people that they have experience with. So I think the men's team in particular has this like weird interconnectivity that, we just don't see. I mean, th- this could feel more like 
back when the U.S. used to send club teams to represent them more than it could feel like uh, the typical all-star national team that we assemble. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was I just pulled up 2019's rosters. Um, and, and, you know, it's it's hard to make a direct comparison. You know, 2019, some of the key players at the time, um, Tanner Johnson, J- John Randolph, um, Eric Taylor on the open side, uh, on the mixed team, Joe Freund, Michael Ng, Julia Kwasnick, uh, Anna Thompson, Joe White, Ann Worth. On the women's side, you know, Dina Elamelek, Abby Hecko, who's back, um, Kara Sieber, Claire Trope, Juliana Worfley, stacked, right? But I, I think you go through this year's star level players and you see similar stacked lines. Don Colton, you already mentioned. Um, Hecko's back, Kennedy McCarthy, Khalil Phillips. Um, Teresa Yu, who is, was so impressive this season for UNC. Uh, on the mix side, uh, Henry Ng, Ava Hanna, Declan Miller, AJ Merriman, Maddie Simcoe. You know, we could go on. On the men's side, you know, I think you've got basically all the players that I would identify. I mean, let's just do the exercise. Keith, pull up the All America first and second team players. And let's ID okay. how many of these players are on this year's U24 teams. All so right. you, can, you, can uh, pick, you can pick your, you know, division where we want to start. Let me pull up. Uh, let me pull up my list here. Lindsay Sue okay. uh, points out in the chat while you pull that up, Keith, the USA delegations have only lost one game in the U24 format. Um, we didn't. And it was the U.S. Uh, did not compete in the first time this tournament was held. Uh, but yeah, it was the wim- the women losing the final to Japan in 2015 when they didn't play Jesse Schaffner enough. We minutes. say it every time. <laughs> we say it every time. And I still. She went in. She came under. She threw like two <laughs> massive backhand hook assists and basically didn't play anywhere else. I just don't. <laughs> I'll never understand. I'll never understand. The coaching uh, was just. I don't remember who's coaching, and so it's not. It's not personal. But the coaching was terrible. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, okay, so here's your here's your all Americans. Uh, we'll start right. in the women's division because that's okay, literally the go. one that's in front of me. Uh, and uh, you know, make your get ready to make your all American jokes when we say the two Canadian players. Um, all right, uh, Alex Barnett, not here, uh, not not here, not eligible. Uh, Abby Hecko, Kennedy yes. McCarthy, yes, women's team. Both. Uh, then then we have three who are not eligible: Ellie Youngs, Bailey Shigley, and Esther yeah, Philbeck. Actually, we got the we got Bailey the, Shigley was eligible, but was not selected. I think that's correct. Uh, yes, that that was that uh, was a blunder. It you know I, I think it, with the benefit of now having seen the whole college season. When when were tryouts again? Like how many months ago was that? Like eight months ago. Mm, I don't know if it was that long ago. It was a winter. It's like winter? November December. So I can see. Ago? Not being sure about a player like like Bailey being a lot healthier and in a better position. To compete. She was still c- coming off the injury right. at that point. But, you know, there are definitely people who are like, wow, this is a huge snub. And that those people were, were proved right by the by the college season. All right. Uh, then you get Mika Kurahashi. She's on the Canadian team. Uh, Dawn Colton. Yep. She's here. Madison Ong. She is on the Canadian team. Chloe Phillips. Yep. She, Stacey Gaskill. All on the women's uh, team, by the way, so far. And then uh, Devin Quinn and Hazel Ostrowski. Uh, yeah, I, I don't did. I, I can't I say that I know I whether think, they tried out. I don't think Quinn tried out, but I think Ostrowski was a snub. I think so. I remember talking about her as a snub. Yeah, she was a surprising uh, miss. And Julia Hasbrook is, is the other one. Don't Devin, know if she Devin tried Quinn out. was on the tryout list. Whether or not she actually tried out, I don't know. Ostrowski gotcha. also was on the tryout list. So, um, okay, let's do the men's side. All right. On the men's side, uh, Henry Ng. Yep. Jock Nissen. Oh, yeah. Ben Dameron. Of course. Wyatt Kelman. I don't know. Did he try out? I don't, I don't think he was. Yeah, he's on a roster, I don't think. He did try out. Okay. Snub. Uh, he, uh, Leo yeah, Gordon. Big snub. Big snub. Uh, I believe is Gordon playing. He's on the men's team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Itai Chang. Of course. Rutledge Smith. 
Yes. Dexter Clyburn. Did he did try he, out? He did not try out. Okay. He's nice with it. Um, he would have. He would have made and, the team. Danny Landisman. Yes. Kevin Pignoni. Yep. Johnny Sickles. Yep. Anton Orm. I think he was a snub. Uh, and, no, he didn't uh, try out. Didn't try out. And Luca Harwood. I think it's the last one. I do not think he made the team. Oh wait, Calvin, Calvin Brown's last one. Sorry, I left off. I left off Calvin Brown. Calvin made the team. He, he, Harwood did not. Yeah, I think. Okay. I think Harwood seems like the kind of player who maybe would have made it after the college season. But he also, maybe you I, know, he's he he seems like somebody who could like throw a lot of turnovers at a tryout and not make the team. <laughs> yeah, I, I could buy that. Anyway, you get the point. There are very few players who had a great college season that didn't make this team. And so um, pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah, Edwards at Stevens points out that Wyatt Kelman was um, hurt at tryouts. I'm not sure how much he even played. Uh, Elliot says in the chat that he didn't play at all. So there you go. Uh, I'm sure he would very much belong on one of these teams at, at full strength. He definitely feels like a good fit, too. He's, yeah, he feels like the kind of player who fits well in these types of teams. So um, I think, uh, you know, we don't need to belabor the point here. These teams are the favorites. Um, somebody asked in the chat, is there somebody you think could break out and kind of somebody who's not already a huge name, Keith, that you think could have a really good tournament and be kind of one of the stars or, you know, at least a significant role player? Um, all right, let's let's take a look at these lists uh, and we'll, we'll try and pick one from each team. Because there are some, there's some definitely some names in here. Uh, man, I, I wish I, I, I'm pretty sure Rita Fetter is hurt, which is too bad. She's, she's a really exciting, uh, exciting player. Yeah, it feels like a cheat to name the, the kids on, uh, on the women's team, but given that they have two high school players, uh, Rachel Chang and Chloe Akimi are probably going to look very much like elite college players right now. Uh, so they feel like they could, if they count as as breakouts, uh, them those are those are the two that jump to mind. Margot Donahue is somebody else who I, I'm a big fan of. Um, but yeah, I would probably go with the high school players. It's a good mixed answer. team. Um, oh man, people probably want me to say Paul Krennic so badly right now. <laughs> uh, I think I'm, uh, does, is Maddie Simcoe like is she is it is it a breakout if Maddie Simcoe goes out and plays really well? Like I don't know. It's it would be surprising for people who are not deeply in the know. I could see Maddie Simcoe being a real problem out there. <laughs> oh, I, 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 Miller is going to play. That's a good question. I don't I'm know sure somebody knows is. if he's been if he's been playing with them right now in their. Prep. Uh, men's team. Hmm. People are going to sleep because he wasn't playing this college season. KJ Koo. He could be a monster. KJ Koo. I mean, yeah, but he's, he's like already an All-American. Like, I mean, it, is Johnny Johnny Sickles? Sure. Is he? I feel like Johnny Sickles could be a could be a big contributor. Like, it wouldn't shock me if he I could see, I could see him. Uh, maybe not leading the team in assists. I feel like Jacques got to be the favorite to do that. But being up there, being up there, it's hard with it, it's it's weird in these tournaments because so many of these games are probably going to be blowouts. I, I'm I'm going to go with uh, Frankie Fernandez on the. Oh, I do like some Frankie Fernandez, team. man. I mean, you know, to come from a like a not heralded college program and make the team is is pretty impressive. Um. I also think, um, man, these UNC guys are probably still going to be the stars of this team, just the, the way they are in, co- in college. Like, Dameron could be a total killer out there. Um, so, let's see. On the other teams, I'm going to go... By the way, Edward Stevens said Maddie Simcoe is the best player, best female matching player at the uh, tryouts in, in, on the East Coast. And he was there, so... We can take his word for it. Um, Jack Brown, for me, is somebody who could have a monster tournament. 
on the women's side, I'm going to say Erica Birdsong, who has I, oh, I low about key been awesome the last like three months. She was really good for UNC at College Nationals. She was a beast at the PUL Championship Weekend for the Radiance. Uh, I think she could really kill it. So, gonna be fun. Gonna be fun to see what happens. And and, and Benji says, I'm curious to see how the mixed team comes together, given that college is single gender in the U.S. Here's the problem: the mixed team is just so vastly more talented than other teams mixed rosters in general at this tournament. I mean, they, they typically are winning the final like 15-4. I just don't think it matters that much. They're too good. Like, sure, maybe they have some overthrows and stuff and there's more turnovers than in the other divisions, but I, I, I think just fundamentally, the level of talent is so much higher than what other teams are sending. Now, maybe some countries also, have stacked their mixed team. I will, I will look forward to seeing if somebody can challenge them. Also, uh, and, and A, I have long said that a country should be trying to stack their mixed team. That's the move. It's it's just, I know you are you might not get a ton of chances of reps outside of this tournament to do that, but like take the time to do that and invest in that because you need a very different makeup of teams. I think you're, I think it's a softer field. Uh, but look at this team and look at the mixed experienced. Uh, Claire Stewart, Maddie Simcoe, Leo Sovel Fernandez, AJ Merriman, Kat McGuire, Henry Ng, Victoria Gray. Uh, I think Liv Goss played mixed. That's like half the like roster. Axel, Axel Agami. Like That's a good basically point. half of this roster has elite club mixed experience. Uh, and I'm sure they were, that was a, a focus at tryouts. And you know, they're looking for players who can uh, play well in, in a mixed style of play. I am a little surprised that we didn't see, you know, when we talked about 2019, there was kind of this trend where a lot of the, Players you would say are the top men's players opted to play in the mixed division. You know, we had uh, Stubbs and Gooch and Joe White. Uh, they were all playing mixed. Anna Thompson was on the mixed team. And I don't. you didn't quite see that pull this year from either the women's team or the men's team, right? Like when you think of the biggest name stars, both of them are generally on these single gender teams, probably with the exception of, of Henry Ng and maybe like Ava Hanna, you might, you might put in that. Like top level yeah, star but, category, but basically. Or, I, guess, of, I guess Hayden Austin Nav has to go there too, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, Keith. Basically, all of the player, all the all American players who are on these teams are on the single gender teams. Almost, yeah, I, I thought we might maybe see more. One, except Henry, I I thought we might see more trend trend the other way after what we saw in 2019, and that was I I don't remember how it shook out for the rosters that never came together, uh, they never got to play. But I guess I have to go look at those. Well, anyway, um, great teams. We're going to see plenty of these teams in the bracket. And of course, it's always fun to think about who could challenge them. Uh, before we go into specific individual team challengers, I want to take a look at the pools uh, overall this year. There are different formats in the different divisions because of the number of teams. So in the mixed division, there's four pools of four. The women's division and the open division, I'm going to start saying open not men's, it's open for WIFTIF. Um, they have two big pools. Uh, so the women's division has 14 teams, the open division has 15 teams, and the mixed division has 16 teams. Um, so, uh, of course, the USA is one seed overall. In the mixed division, the next top teams are Japan, Singapore, and Canada. In the women's division, Japan, Colombia, and Canada. And the open division, Canada, Japan, and Italy. Now, of course, these are mostly backwards looking, not predictive of kind of where teams are right now. How far back are they looking? <laughs> right, right. Um, this is like basically there are very there, how, how, in the U.S. only has a ha small handful of players returning from the 2019 Two. teams. It's and yeah, that's Two, right. And they're both Echo it's, and it's Gasculin. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, this is basically an entirely new tournament. Uh, now, of course, the teams we just talked about, the countries have strong histories. But for instance, you know, the Italian Open team, they're probably going to be good, but they're not the best team in Europe, Keith. Uh, let, can I, let me sidebar just briefly, because I was thinking about this. I actually think that that gap is probably in the Americans' favor. 
uh, at my first, at first thought, I was like, oh, okay, well, we have basic like the U.S. is basically it's no players who played U24 before. But I actually think that because those high level reps are valuable for other countries, and Amer- the Americans get to approximate that through their club, co- high level college, and semi pro play. I think that might actually favor the American teams if every team is going to be inexperienced and have very few players who've played like in a big international event like this. Like obviously, like if you play in like European Championships, it's an international event, but it's not. I think the same as as playing in this World Championships. I think that probably favors the U.S. overall. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm not sure that I feel strongly one way or the other. I think in some ways it's helpful for the other countries to feel like maybe they can kind of sneak up on the U.S. because they have <laughs> like a really good youth pipeline. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I think the U.S. is always going to be in a good position because of the depth of talent. Um, and the really robust college division that helps develop these players in an effective way. Um, you know, what other countries have in some cases is they have a bunch of players who've played together on a high level club team. And so when all the, you know, when they get that big batch of five or six really strong players who are all 23 um, at the same time, they can have a really a big year. And so that's, that's what I'm looking for. So, Keith, any thoughts on on the pools themselves before we talk about individual teams? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think in the in the in the mixed division, it's like a little less significant to me because everything's so spread out. Uh, maybe maybe it's in the women's and open division is where I really should say that because so many of these teams are are going to make the bracket. Uh, but I do think that the the pool makeup feels a little more important to me in those divisions. You know, like I think I think for Canada in the women's division that they have a great draw, right? They're going to get to see the US and get a chance to test themselves out against the US, scout the US a little bit, try and figure out the matchups. And then the whatever happens, whether they win or lose that game, assuming that the US and Canada both don't lose any of the other games, they're going to be on the opposite end of the bracket from the US. So then they can play the US in the finals, hopefully, and have their have their scouting done and be as prepared as possible try and leverage some sort of coaching advantage or strategic advantage. So I think for the Canadian women's team, they have a great draw. Like they don't, I wouldn't want to be in a pool with Japan, Colombia, and Italy. That's, that's not good. I'd much, I would think I'd, I think on paper, I'd much rather see Germany and Ireland than I would those other three. Uh, so to me, Canada has a great draw. And I guess in some ways you probably could say the same thing about Italy, the two seed in pool a, the team seated uh, behind the U S Right, they fade Canada, Japan, this Belgium team that's got a lot of buzz. Uh, you know, I, I do think that there's there's it's going to be a little tough in that pool at points, but I think this is a, that's probably where you want to be if you're Italy. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Belgium team. Let's talk about them. They're certainly in the kind of buzzy conversation for teams that maybe have a chance to challenge the U.S. Belgium has a bunch of players who are big contributors to the moon catchers who made that huge run at WUCC last year. Remember they beat Sakai in that amazing game. Um, so Belgium uh, has, you know, a, a handful of names, particularly I think Dan Demaray, uh, and forgive my pronunciation. I'm not on the mic this weekend at U24, so I don't have to learn all the pronunciations, uh, but Demaray has been one of the best players, if not literally the best player in Europe this year. At, and he's going to be leading this team. Um, and Louis Betrancor, uh is going to be somebody to keep an eye on defensively. We've got some great intel in the Discord on that. If you head over to the Wiftif channel. Um, Ooh, is this to mean I get to, uh, does I, do I get to say the name that you're missing? Ben? Go is ahead. Ben Yonkers. Not ref, oh. but Ben. Yeah, not ref. Uh, but bet. Uh, so we get so we get a Yonkers in there, and you know, obviously, the kind of playmaking that they bring to the table. So, I mean, I, I I guess the question is, Keith, do you see enough here to feel like, hey, yeah, this team's got a shot? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this is. It sounds like a, a group that's has has some you know sights on a, a deep run that's usually going to lead to a lot of preparation. Uh, you've got the top end players who can take over a game, which I think in some of these some of these settings can be all you need. Yes, the U.S. tends to overwhelm people with the the back end of the roster, 
But if you can make it a game where you're tight and you can let some of your top end players just kind of pull you for some extra distance, that goes a long way. And it isn't always about just beating the U.S., right? I think this Belgian team has what it takes to beat the other teams. Like getting a silver medal would be like a pretty sweet accomplishment oh, yeah. for Belgian Ultimate. So uh, I definitely think that they have what it takes. I, I mean, Dan Marie could be the most productive player at this whole tournament. It's it's going to be a lot of fun to see some of the the players break out. You know, you remember last time around, um, the Singapore mixed team, like crazy playmaking. Uh, there's we're going to see those stars emerge again, and that's what's one of the the best things about this tournament. Now, a few people have already asked, and we have discussed it before on the podcast, but for the Colombian women's team, Cardenas twins, sorry, they're not eligible. They're one year too old so they kind of missed their shot in what would have been the 2021 cycle to pick off the u.s and win and you know i'm sure columbia is still going to be a good team but to be honest with you i think that the kind of the golden generation of colombian women they're playing at the high level right now i I don't know that we're necessarily going to see this next wave of tremendous talent now maybe i'll get proven wrong this weekend and we see something from them and they're really impressive but we don't we don't have the kind of quality that we've seen from you know cartagena the cardenas twins um go down the list of all of the superstar players on the now adult colombian roster so too bad because it was going to be a lot of fun uh valeria was so tremendous i mean both manu and valeria were amazing uh back in 2019 they were they were like the perfect recipe to make for this incredible narrative. It's like, okay, can can two world class players who are just like so beyond what almost anybody else is going to be doing, uh, who've been at this for so long, helping build up their community? Like, can they can they conquer the 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 Goliath in this matchup? Uh, so sad we won't get to see it. And there definitely are some names on the Columbia team that that I recognize, but. You know, uh, maybe maybe they'll develop some new stars. I would love to see it. I do think this is kind of going to be a, not a referendum per se, but a, a preview of what we can expect from the long tail for Columbia Women's Ultimate. Like, what happens when this this crop of players that have led the way for them for what ten years now? Uh, what happens when those players start to age out a little bit? What, what what goes on for the rest of the community? What quality are they going to be able to bring? Will they be able to maintain such a prominent position in women's play globally? Very curious to see. And I think this is going to be a preview of, of what the future holds for Columbia. I mean, that's what's great about this tournament. More so than Junior Worlds, I think this tournament is predictive of where countries are and where they will be uh, it, You know, at next year's World Ultimate Championships a little bit. You know, if you see some really high quality play from four or five players on on a, on a team's roster, and you look at what they were bringing to WCC, um, and then you think, okay, well, how is that going to project to Australia next summer? That's that's going to be pretty interesting because it's it's been so long since we've seen an international non club tournament, right? The the last one was U twenty fours, because then everything got canceled in twenty twenty. Everything got canceled in 2021, and we had a club tournament last year. Now, I mean, the club tournament is still interesting, but you have U.S. players on rosters, and you have all kinds of crazy stuff. This is our first chance to see, in four years, country-based play, and that's pretty cool. All right, where should, where should we go next here? Who's the, who's well, the next buzzy it, team that's got you? Oh, gosh. I mean, I think the Canadian women are certainly a team that we have to, to talk about. Um, we know that they have a lot of players who competed together playing for UBC. And, you know, of course, UBC coming up short to UNC, who goes on to win their third straight championship. But honestly, Keith, I think the UNC Pleiades team, if you cloned the, pl- the, the players who were <laughs> on... The, the USA women's team and you put the USA UNC 2023 Pleiades team into the into the tournament they would win the tournament is that crazy you to think, say you think that the the UNC Pleiades team with clones would beat the U24 women's team from that the is US. what I'm telling you yes do you think I'm wrong yes 
You're you're on one. I mean, Alex, I don't Alex think you so. get Alex Barnett, you get Ellie, Ellie Youngs, but you're stacking that up against the entire rest of like the All Americans, stands the Canadians against Gaskill, Phillips, Hecko, all together. As I'm not saying they're more talented. Okay, they so they also get all the like tremendously time, more the, continuity. That's of fair. course, that's fair. I don't know. I still, I still think I got to take the killed everybody, Keith. I don't know. I, I am getting corrected, and I'm sorry. It's my mistake. UBC lost to Colorado in the semis, not UNC. And they kind of got thumped. Um, yes. But, but they have a lot of really good players. And I don't think they played their best game. They, they looked amazing in that tournament. And I think they struggled a little bit in the stadium setting uh, and the pressure of that. Now, maybe that comes to rear its head again because the bracket games at U24s, they're going to be they were to have packed fields. I, I heard they already sold out of tickets for the finals. That's like why you can't buy GA tickets anymore. <laughs> so that's going to be fun. It, it uh, should be for a great environment. Hopefully, hopefully the, the lights are too bright this time around. Uh, but Canada also has, they have a lot of continuity uh, as far as like, they have a lot of players who are familiar with one another, who've played together a lot. You kind of have the, the West and East Coast contingents. You have like the UBC contingent, and then you have the kind of Toronto Sixers area contingent, and then a few other players. So like they're getting Sarah Jacobson somehow is, is eligible for this team. Uh she if, if she's healthy, she's gonna be absolute monster. Uh th- this looks like a good good version of the Canadian team. And like I Japan is is a wild card. Like I can't say that I know a lot about the background of the individual players on Japan. Uh, but we've we've seen time and time again how good Japanese ultimate is. Like they just produce quality teams. So like to me, those are the three teams that the conversation is about in the women's division. It's yeah, Canada, it, Japan, and the U.S. And everybody else is is like a a tier below. There's a gap. We, we've seen a little bit of a downtrend in Japanese men's ultimate. You know, Buzz Bullets certainly not the team they once were. The Japanese teams at uh, WCC, not super impressive, but on the women's side, I think still a lot of talent. Now, I don't, I agree. I, I can't really speak specifically to the players on U24s, but stylistically and just like th- from the quality of talent that we see it distributed across a number of various club teams in Japan, you know, those teams come to the US Open and very much hold their own. And there's like two or three of the teams. So when they're able to concentrate their talent, they're always really tough. Always really tough. Yeah, they're they're. It's hard to expect them. I mean, you just look at the the background, particularly in in women's. I mean, they have they have won silver or gold in at every U twenty three tournament that they've attended. They missed one in twenty eighteen. They, they I don't think they were at the tournament. The only team to beat the U.S. and then they finished silver in all the other years. So like. What, what more can you ask for in, in women's from Japan than that? And then, you know, in mixed, they've won the past two silvers in mixed. They won a bronze in 2013. Uh, in men's, obviously, they've, they haven't had quite the same success. They were in the semifinals in 2019. Uh, they have uh, a bronze in 2015 and a silver in 2010. So a little bit more spread out for them. And, and that, that's, I think, the division where we have the lowest expectations for, the, for them anyway. But in the women's division, we've seen nothing but excellence. I don't see any reason to doubt that until we get evidence otherwise. Who else, Keith? Um, are there any mixed teams that you're like looking at specifically? I mean, should, should we expect a reprise from Singapore? I, they're, they're a team you got to be curious about after what we saw last time. And not only what we saw from the team last time, but the stories we were hearing of the investment in the team that they were basically being run with the, the kind of resources and intention that, that other countries are putting into their like Olympic level athletes. Like they, they were getting access to quality training facilities, like stuff you don't usually hear about associated with ultimate. So uh, yeah, the players may be different, but my, my real question is like, what's been the background? What's been the, did, did some of that stuff fade away with the pandemic? I don't know. Or is that investment only increased? Like, could they come out and be even better than last time? And which I guess, you know, putting them third in, in, uh, in the seating puts a pretty high expectation on them. 
So meddling is a pretty high expectation for a country without a, a long history of, of international success. But I remember the stories of what was being done back home to help prepare this team. And if that kind of stuff has continued, they could be a really interesting power in the mixed division. We finally could see a team doing what we talked about of, of dumping their resources into competing and in mixed. Uh, so they're, they, they're a team I'm very curious about. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I'm a, I know their players. I simply don't, but this is, a, it's a country where you see a lot of mixed play and I think you have to give them the big benefit of the doubt after showing up big last time. Um, and somebody said earlier up in the chat that, you know, we should expect uh, if, you know, because Singapore's done all this investment, Keith, that the floor has risen and that we should expect all of their teams to outperform expectations. Because I, I would say for the most part, people probably still have modest expectations for what they might do. Yeah, they're, they're definitely a team to watch. In, in a similar vein, I'm kind of curious. Like, I know the seeding isn't very high on the Chinese teams, but we've heard all this buzz about the increasing popularity of Ultimate in China. It, maybe it's a little early for that to start to bear fruit, but, you know, if they outperform their seed, I feel like it wouldn't come as a shock. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's just be, become huge. Uh, I was talking to somebody who said that like some of the, some of the like pop culture faddishness has started to fade off a little bit, but that there's still a really strong contingent of people who take it a little bit more seriously and are there to play and compete. Um, and I, I would say my guess is that we're not going to see them, you know, shock the world, but that we might see the seeds of, future success because obviously you know given what japan has been able to do with a vastly smaller population could we see chinese ultimate if it continues on this trajectory i mean in in five or ten years you're looking at the next columbia except with a way 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 bigger population to draw from <laughs> so that's a pretty interesting uh story of this year's tournament is just like the t t huge growth in, in chinese ultimate and we'll, we'll certainly be following along on that on the broadcasts um, we have yet to mention Australia, Keith, and I think that's wrong because I think there's, I, I think that all of the Australian teams have a good chance to go out there and, and get a medal. Well, we'll we'll see about that. Uh, they they do have a have a pretty good track record, uh, but 2019 not not necessarily the best showing for them. The men the men finished fifth, which is pretty solid. The women finished just out of last place. You know that I, I this I do expect a bounce back. Like I, I I would be surprised if they have that kind of performance again. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's a big climb to go from there to medal contention. They do have a couple players who go far all the way back to that 2019 team. Uh, still in the pipeline. But I, I don't know. That's that's really tough. Also, weirdly, if I'm not mistaken, I could I could be wrong about this, but. I'm pretty sure their under 22 like national tournament is happening basically at the back end of when this tournament's happening. I don't know if that's true or not, but when I was trying to do some research, I was like, am I reading this right? Does this really say that the under 22 championships are like at roughly the same time as the under 24? Maybe there's not a lot of crossover between those two things, but I found that a little odd. <laughs> well, one, there's probably not a lot of crossover. And number two is that I think the players who are good enough that are 21 years old and who are good enough to play on the U24 team are just going to be choosing to play on the U24 Agreed. team. <laughs> Agreed, but wouldn't that water down your under-22s? I don't know. I, it, yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, I, you know, it's, it's hard. I, I wish we could get in here and talk more about individual players, but it's super hard uh, because we haven't, there's not a lot of returners because of the, the fact that we haven't had this tournament in, in four years. Um, I will, Nate pointed out that he feels like Australia is poised for a big tournament. Raya Carpenter, Angela Pigeon, and Alicia Chua on the women's team are very good. Uh, Lucien Noel plays for the men's team, which is a familiar name here in the U.S. because he played with Darkside um, and was a, honestly a pretty important D-line player for them. And Edmund Fang, uh, a another player for Sunder. Uh, that's the 
the club team down the the strong top uh, open club team down in Australia, and uh, the mixed team Eric Deng, uh, Curtis Lai, and Jess Lowry. So some shout outs there. Um, I don't doubt at all that that Australia will have great top end players. My question is more about like what do we see from the back half of their roster? And yeah, Julie Julie Chong too. Uh, that, that seems like somebody worth 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 noting. Uh, yeah, we we. I definitely want to pick more through the rosters and kind of like go across you know, maybe some of the WUCC data and see, you know, okay, who can we find who was playing at you know, club <laughs> right. championships? Like just try and get a better sense of, of who some of these teams are. But yeah, we, we go into this tournament and you learn a lot on the fly about who's good and who's not. And, and you look a lot at history, which is a little weird because you're a lot of times you're like talking about players who aren't even the same players as, as the last time that you watch these teams play, and it's, it's exacerbated this year. So it's, it's extra difficult. So questions from the chat. Would love to hear about it. Uh, Benji points out that the Australia U- U24 women's team beat the uh, GB women's senior team at the London Invite last weekend. So that's obviously a pretty good sign. Now, I got to admit, GB Ultimate kind of in a bad shape right now. Uh, and I'm not sure that I see much hope on the horizon for them here at U24s, but uh, it could be a wake-up call kind of a tournament for them. And uh, you know, investment in youth ultimate is going to be important if they want to stay relevant in Europe. I and mean, we haven't seen a GB team like really pop off in quite some time, and they were one of the bottom teams at the World Games last year. Uh, but uh, Benji does note that Tom's tourney, the GB women won that. So that's uh, obviously a very strong sign for the Australia U24 side. They're, they're, they're certainly a team to watch. Also, do, do you know if we have any, uh, do we have any, you know, you mentioned like uh, Lucy Noel. Are there any other players we've seen from uh, that have been playing in the US that we see on other rosters? I'm, I'm kind of scrolling through to see if uh, there's Ben Ort. Would be one. Um, he's playing for the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> That's a pretty good pickup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. We'd probably have to go through rosters and like scrub through them. I'm just. Thinking, I'm, I'm just scrolling. The easiest place to start is thinking about are there are there young players in the AUDL? That's like I feel like that's been the number one place where we've seen imports playing. Or so, in some cases, the the women's pro leagues as well. But I, I'm hmm. not I'm not super. It's not it's not super obvious to me that there's a lot of players that fit that bill. Yeah, I feel like we haven't heard of many, and I, I feel like usually we there are a few. There's like a handful that pop up, and and often to to great effect. I mean, they, usually these are impactful players for the teams that they're competing with. But it's not something I've heard a lot about this year. So so don't know if we'll if we'll see that. Um. Yeah, an interesting note that Benji brings this up, and I, I meant to mention it earlier. France is not sending teams to this tournament. So uh, it's going to be disappointing. Preparing for Europeans and next year's World Ultimate Championships. Uh, it is disappointing because I think they would have been very competitive here. And to me, it's very unusual because this tournament is in Europe. You know, it's one thing if they were playing in the U.S. or something, but for this tournament to be a European tournament and then have them not show up. I can't imagine everybody's happy about that. That that cannot have been a widely loved decision. Uh, so very very strange, to be honest. I wonder if there's some political stuff going on there. I know you you feel like you want to strike while the iron iron's hot, right? Oh, absolutely. You know they've they've had great junior programs, and it feels like a country that's very much on the rise. So it's 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 strange to not take advantage of a tournament that's in Europe. And where you could get a lot of great development for some of your players who are obviously going to be important uh, playmakers for your your national teams at next year's world championships. Yeah, and and seeing the European teams in particular, that's that's definitely something I'm I'm gonna you want to kind of get a sense of where they of how they stack up with each other. Especially, you know, I think that the World Games was eye opening for a lot of people as far as the quality of play that you you could get out of the European countries. Uh, but we've also seen, you know, like in the women's division, you see Ireland, they're seated pretty high and women's ultimate's been on the rise in Ireland. They, they've done well in uh, international competition. And when their club teams have traveled ab- ab- abroad, uh, the Italian scene obviously has done quite well for itself in both open and, and women's. 
And could we see that trend continue? I think I, I'm I'm trying to see the rosters. Maybe somebody can help me remember. I feel like there were two players in the age bracket on the GB World Games team. Uh two two female matching players. I don't know if they're playing in this tournament or not, but I feel like there were two players who were pretty young, like 24 and under, uh, on that GB women's team. But I feel like we would have been hearing about them if they were on the roster. So uh Somebody, somebody, I'm sure will will get us in the chat if uh, if necessary. But that, that would be a pretty big story right there. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of World Games talent that's going to be here. Future World Games talent, yes, but not current. <laughs> and it, you know, as was mentioned in the chat, the the European Ultimate Championships start July 15th. So uh, they're in Ireland. So uh, you know, it is certainly you can see why maybe some the France Federation would say, well, if we're going to go to a week-long tournament, not in our country, we're going to choose European over U24 Worlds. Fair enough. I don't love the scheduling decision here, but I guess what can you do? Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of stuck in some ways. There's only so many weeks in the summertime. Um, okay, so uh, right. Keith, who's... who's let me give you Go a ahead. question then. All right. Okay. More more likely. How much more likely is it that like let's let's get into the odds here? USA sweep versus USA not sweep. Where 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 do you where you send the math on that? Sweep. Sweep favorite. Well, yeah. I think the sweep is the favorite, but how big how big a favorite are we talking here? I don't know. I mean I I feel like each team has like a 80 plus percent chance to win the tournament. So I'd have to do the math on that, but I feel like it's like 60, 40 to 60% chance. They sweep maybe, maybe a little higher than that. Which, which team do you think has the, has the biggest chance of, of not sweeping, of not winning Um, based on what I know of rosters. I think I would say the USA women's team simply because the Canadian team is is very strong. And I think like we'll absolutely give them a game. It like yeah, like I young, get hyped about the Belgium. Young. Right. And I could get hyped about the Belgium open team and like that sounds exciting, but I don't know that I really see them beating the USA open team. Yeah. I think I'd probably say the the women's team too. I I'd love to see the mixed team get a real challenge. I feel like they they dog people every year, uh, but you know mixed has more fun according to them. So uh, I guess it's working out. <laughs> Keith, I got to plug in my computer. So ask me the next question. All right. Um, let's see. I, I I feel like we're getting close to to making the picks time here. I feel like we're like we're coming down the wire. To figure out who's gonna who we're gonna pick, uh, I don't know if we want to. Maybe we just pick the medalists. Maybe that's the move this year. Oh, I definitely um, think we should we should just focus on picking the medalists. Yeah, but like not semis. I mean, basically one uh, slot yeah, short. No. Who's gonna win the basically? Who's gonna win the bronze medal match? <laughs> uh, yeah, we can we can do it. Um, which division do you want to start in? Uh, why don't we start in mixed? Okay. This is the um, one where, where the pool winners get the big advantage because they get the buy. Or sorry, the, yeah, the, the power pool with power the pool, pool winners. winners and then the top finishers in the power pool. Right. Um, okay. So mixed. Um, I'm checking out the Canadian roster real quick. Definitely, it's just not to the same level of quality as the open division rosters. Um, well, let me just go ahead and say USA is going to win the gold. I'm going to go ahead and just take, take that off the board. Just copy um, and paste. I think I'm going to take, I'm going to just go ahead and roll the dice on Singapore to take silver. And I will go with, um, Japan for bronze. Man, I'm tempted to take I, I was, Australia, though. I, I'm going to take Australia. I'm going to take Australia. 
I mean, bought, you bought the chat hype right away. It took very little to convince you, huh? That's right. Um, all right. Uh, well, good. That opened, so, so wait, you're taking Australia for bronze and Singapore Australia for silver for bronze. Still? Man, I was kind of hoping that I could I could jump on the on the Singapore bandwagon. All right, um, I'm gonna take. Yeah, I'm taking the U.S. Uh, I'll take Japan to, to finish second. And how about this Swedish team? What do we do? We, do we <laughs> what do we know about Sweden? You know, uh, uh, not that much, right? I guess I'll take Canada. They're, they're for, only for sending. They're only sending the one team. I saw that, which was part of what made me think about them. So uh, I can't say that I know much about the players on their roster, but it's always a good idea to consider a, a country that's only sending the one mixed team. I feel like I feel like there's always one. You know, it's it's mixed. There's always somebody who who throws a wrench in things. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll with no actual knowledge of this, I'll I'll go ahead and take Canada to finish bronze. <laughs> I don't know. I can't pick, I don't, I don't I can't pick Singapore after you did first. I mean, I think you just you're just giving away points, but I'll I I accept you doing that. Um, okay, how about on the women's side? You you can go first. All right. Well, I'm I am this despite our our protestations about them being the the most likely foil. I'm still going to take the U.S. to win the gold here. Um, I'm going to take Canada second. I'm trying to take a quick look at this. Japanese roster to see if this if there's any familiarity here. Um, hmm. It's also hard. They've they've. That's tough. They've just done so well over the years. I, I I'm still gonna take Japan to finish finish in third. I I, I want to stump for uh, like Italy or Ireland, but Japan's just had such such a good history. A couple of people have asked in the chat about um, the ro- the rosters being available. Um, I do not think they are posted publicly yet. Uh, I do have an internal copy that I cannot put in the chat, unfortunately. So, yes, the rosters exist, but they're not publicly posted yet. Sorry. Um, I, I, I actually just got the rosters today. So, it's <laughs> not like I've had them for weeks and they haven't done it yet. I think they're just getting it all pulled together. Um, I basically okay. got them right before we went on air. So <laughs> I'm going, I'm going, oh, uh, Keith, I want the same three teams. Uh, uh, okay. Europeans in the chat. Does this Italian women's roster have a chance? Because I kind of want to pick them, but I don't really know if we've got much data on, on them at this point. I mean, USA and Canada are definitely feeling like, um, the key key two. Um, so I'm taking USA to win it. Uh, La Fiata, Robbie asks, is La Fiata on the roster? No, she is not. She is not. Um, gosh. I, I'm, I'm just going to take the same three teams. I, I was trying to talk myself into Japan finishing silver, but this Canadian roster is really good. Um. So I'm, know, I'm, it, I'm going USA, Canada, Japan as well. Yeah. Okay. We're definitely, we got to be wrong. Okay. We can't, you can't <laughs> come to pass. Maybe All Columbia right, uh, will surprise us. I, I feel a little more confident that, that we'll see someone like Italy or uh, Australia or Ireland surprise us more than Columbia. But yeah, I could be wrong. I, I could see, I could see Australia. I, I wouldn't count it out. Um, okay. Open side. Let's see. How much do I want to buy into this Belgium hype? I kind of want to buy in. It's pretty it, convincing. To get on it, the doesn't, it, doesn't seem, it, it doesn't seem that fluffy, to be honest. No, it doesn't, because it's not like you're like, it's like, oh, they have this guy who nobody's heard of, but he's going to, he's about to go beast mode. No, it's like, no, they, they have clearly productive elite club level players. <laughs> um, and the like consensus number one player in Europe right now. That, that's a pretty yeah. big deal. The, I, I think it's going to be enough because of, with the continuity of the team, I'm going to take this team to get silver. I'm still picking the USA. I'm sorry. I can't pick the upset. I just don't see it. Uh, I'm taking USA to win Belgium second. And do I like this Canadian roster? 
I don't not really. I mean, there's a couple names. Oscar Stonehouse will probably have a great tournament. Jakob Brissett. Uh, but not super pumped about what I see there. I'm gonna take Columbia to get bronze. Could be Italy, but I'm gonna here's, take Columbia. I'm gonna take Columbia. Here's the thing about Australia for me. If they if where they finish in pool play is gonna be pretty vital. I mean, I guess they could still get bronze, but what it, there's there's just there's a lot of ways that they have to play the US in semis or in quarters. Uh if they finish fourth in the pool, which it feels a little low for them. They play them in quarters. If they finish second in the pool, that feels very possible, especially if they're as good as, as we hear, or for Belgium, excuse me, I said Australia, but I meant Belgium. Um, then then they have to play uh, the U.S. In, in semis. That makes me a little iffy on them. Okay, I, I, here's a little more hype. Here's a little more hype just to get just to get okay. you thinking about something Keep else. Robbie says hydrate. in the chat, Italy U24 beat GB Open earlier this year, which is basically the Clapham team that took bronze at WCC last year. Oh, you don't you don't have to convince me. I, I'm I'm You're already fully basically on the Italy gonna, hype. I was going to take Italy. Yeah, Italy's in my. It's basically how do I want to uh, <laughs> shape up Italy, Japan, Belgium, and Canada from here? Because I'm I'm going to take the US to win. Um. Okay, yeah, I think I'll go U.S., Italy, Belgium in that order, I think. Feels okay. weird to, to, yeah, to leave so, off Japan I, and Canada. I but, left yeah. Australia in all three divisions. I feel like I'm definitely going to get burned for the, doing that. I don't know. You could, but I don't know, man. Uh, hey, they were, they were awesome at World Games, Keith. They sure they were. Won, they could have won the whole thing. Now, I know that those, I don't think there's literally any crossover between those rosters, but it's a good sign for Australian Ultimate. You're, not, you're not wrong about that. Yeah. Um, all right. They, so they, they, had a great, they had a great world clubs, too. Uh, so there, there are players from WCC. You know, they had, they've had Ellipsis and Lunchbox both, uh, both do quite well. In, in world clubs and you know Sunder top 10 performance they yep. multiple teams in every division so uh yeah I, I, there's definitely reasons to be excited about about that Australian contingent the streaming schedule is out now there are two primary ways to get access um pretty much everybody here I, by definition has some level of access to watching the streams with a uh, full subscription which is soon to be called standard we're changing the names um, you'll get access to the, to the primary showcase streams with commentary and multiple cameras on fields one and two. Plus, subscribers will get access to those games as well as our bonus field three games, which will be broadcast with a single camera uh, and without commentary, just natural sound. Uh, if you choose, you can upgrade your uh, your full subscription uh, to a plus subscription for just a month um, in order to get the uh, additional games and uh, you could always then step back down to full if you wanted to. Alternatively, you could just get yourself a U24 event pack. Those are $16.99 and that gets you all of the video forever. Um, and so that's also a choice to make. There's some free streams every single day up until the semifinals day uh, over on our YouTube channel. And um, I think this is pretty cool. So I just wanted to mention it here. Colum those Folks who are from Colombia, India, and the Philippines have an opportunity to get the event pack for just $4.99. So all you have to do is save a payment method with an address from that country in your UltiWorld account, and you'll automatically get the discounted price. Um, I don't know if we have folks in this listening to this here that uh, that applies to, but certainly on the wider Deep Look podcast, uh, once we put it out on onto all of the podcast networks, you'll want to uh, be able to take advantage of that and let folks know from those countries. This is a pretty cool pilot program that we're working on with WIFDIF, and uh, we could see this expanding in the future uh, if it goes well this year to you know try to increase the affordability of the streaming uh, options for uh, places where there's not as much purchasing power. So 
uh, we'll keep an eye on that and I'll probably have some more details on that um, after the tournament, how it went and everything. So Josh wants to know what games is everybody most excited to watch? So Keith, I'll let you answer while we get some answers from the chat. Hmm. Most excited to watch. Uh, and well, probably from the showcase uh, options, right? From the streaming. Right, of course. Of course. For the brand, right? Um, now that now that I need to, I mean, we have we have we have pretty much the best games in here, so uh, I don't actually have to fudge it or anything. You know, I, I, the one of the ones that jumps out to me, I talked about it earlier, but getting a getting the feel for in women's the Canada U.S. matchup, getting to see that come out play out in pool play is uh, definitely intriguing to me. I'm all, like I'm as much curious about how those two teams look, and also. The gamesmanship of that one, the chess match, you know, you, do, you probably don't want to pull everything out against your potential metal contender, uh, but you also want a chance to refine some of those things that you may need to use in the final. So it's like a great chance to test your metal, especially when you're if you're winning a lot of your other games by a large margin. So how do we see the two coaching staffs approach the matchup against one another? Are we going to see them hold back? Are we going to see them? Go ahead and open open it up to make sure they get the quality reps in. Well, very very curious. So that that matchup has me particularly intrigued uh, because I think it has such big implications for what we might see down the line. Uh, I'm you know this is kind of a cop out, but like power pool mixed games are going to be a lot of fun. You know I'm not sure that I'm like super stoked about any of the standard matchups. Um, you know in regular pools, but. I'm 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 curious to see what the Chinese team looks like. You know, the Japan versus China game around one on Monday could be pretty cool. Uh, but the power pool game should be awesome because we're going to see the best teams matching up, and it's not quite elimination yet. So, uh, just vying for a a, a buy. Um, otherwise, let's see on the on the open side. Um, uh, I think. Uh, Italy Colombia is one I'm gonna want to watch. I mean, I picked this Colombia team. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I should have picked them, but uh, <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens there. Um, how does this? Uh, let's see. On the women's side, I think. Um, well, the obviously the USA Canada game is going to be awesome. Um, I'm kind of curious to see this Philippines team. Because that's another country where there's like a lot of ultimate going on. They play Colombia uh, first thing Sunday morning in round one. And I feel like that's going to be kind of a cool game. You know, four years ago, it would have just been like total Colombia blowout. But will it be this time? I don't know. We also we have Italy, uh, Colombia open. That's another one that I, that is interesting to me. Uh, like you, I'm, like we, we both talked about Singapore and China, how we're curious about them. Uh, we have Australia and China uh, on Tuesday morning. Uh, so you know, we, we know that the, this Australian team is, is going to be at, at worst to be solid. So that'll be a, a good measuring stick for where China's at, in the, at least in women's competition. Um, uh, Sue points out that uh, it's great watching Japan play one of the most distinct styles you don't often see. And, and certainly that's true, you know, especially for those of us who watch a lot of American uh, and North American Ultimate, it's just so totally different stylistically. I wish we had more of that. Maybe we'll see more of that this year. Or it's a little surprise. Like you would think that somebody would be like, "Let's just do that. Let's get a Japanese, somebody who understands Japanese Ultimate, to just come and teach that in the U.S." Like, what if some some co- regional level college team was like? Let's just learn how to play ultimate, like as if we were coming up in, J- in Japanese ultimate. Like, obviously, it's hard to do, but with the right coaching, you know, is it that different than trying to institute hex? I don't know. Who's going to run hex? Somebody's going to run hex. Somebody, people are running hex now in college ultimate. Right. Probably in club too. What if a hex team wins? Felix is going to go crazy. I'm, I'm, yeah, that, that would be. <laughs> Yeah, that would Singapore be big, allegedly big on the hex train says Ravi. There okay, amazing. Um, all right, well, Keith, I, I think uh, we will we will certainly reconvene for a mid tournament update and probably some more uh, 
around the tournament itself. Keith, you're not coming over to Europe. I'm I'm sad to say. I'm not. But, uh, yeah. What I'm am sorry, I doing with all this luggage then? <laughs> sorry, I forgot. I thought we talked about this. Oh man, that is, I just got cut live on air, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll I'll be over in the UK. I'm actually going to be in Europe for three weeks, Keith. So we're going to have to figure out when we record Deep Look. It's only five hours to the UK, but when I'm in Finland, I think we're going to have a little bit more challenge on our hands. Uh, but I uh, hope everybody enjoys the U24 coverage and uh, gets excited for everything we're going to be able to, to watch and enjoy. I think this is the most games ever streamed at U24 Worlds uh, by some distance. So enjoy. Uh, hopefully it doesn't rain too much and uh, send us your thoughts uh, here in the in the discord or to deep look at ultiworld.com and we will uh, touch base with you again midway through the tournament and for Keith Rayner I'm Charlie Eisenhood saying so long join us for our subscriber bonus segment out the back where we're going to be talking a little bit about some college award stuff as well as some early club season interesting results from both the east and the west coast so that is going to do it for this one we'll talk to you next week right here on deep look Thank you.